a call to meeting the um, Monday meeting of, um, I guess it's March 27th, meeting of Senate Education. Welcome to everyone for being here. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Buck. Here. Senator Onyate. Here. Senator Flores. Present. Senator Hammond. Senator Neal. Senator Titus. Here. Chair Lang. Here. And please mark Senator Hammond excused. Welcome audience, we have a quorum and so we will um, begin our meeting. Um, we are going to hear, have a bill hearing today and also a presentation from um, the Commission on School Funding, Guy Hobbs. And we'll, we're going to take um, the presentation first and the bill hearing second, if that's okay with the presenter. Um, please silence your electronic devices. If you wish to testify, please sign up over at the clipboard by the door. And when you're testifying, please um, ensure that you turn on the microphone and state your name every time you speak uh, for the record. And if you have copies uh, for the public, please make sure that you had 10 copies with you. They were submitted by 1 o'clock yesterday. And those materials are available also on NALIS. We will do public comment at the end of the meeting, and you can submit your public comments in writing. If you don't choose to speak, or if you go over the time, and um, committee members will be using their laptops from time to time to look up information so they can be better informed and prepared for the hearing. So with that, I would like to ask um, Mr. Hobbs, I see you're at the table. We want to welcome you back to Senate Education and hope that you feel like you have a little more time this uh, for this presentation. We want to make sure that we um, hear from what you have to say and that there's plenty of time for the committee to ask questions. So please go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, Guy Hobbs. Uh, chair and representing the Commission on School Funding. We have had the opportunity to get together once uh, prior to this. Uh, I did bring a, a presentation that will cover some of the material just as a refresher that, that we went over the last time we were together and then some additional material um, that We'll speak to one of the assignments the commission was given uh, just by way of, again, a refresher. The, the commission was tasked with um, a couple of major uh, assignments. One had to do with the pupil-centered funding plan, working through that. Uh, we achieved that in the first two years of our existence and filed reports. Um, and uh, the pupil-centered funding plan has been encoded uh, into law and is working uh, as it should at this point. We were also asked to identify optimal levels of funding for education. And uh, if we were to identify optimal levels of funding, we were also asked to identify methods over which that might, might be funded in the ensuing 10 years. And, and that's largely what uh, the presentation today will focus on is some of the the findings by way of recommended funding uh, over the next 10 years to achieve the target funding levels. Uh, I'm going to skip a few of the slides because you've seen them before, but what you have uh, hopefully in front of you um, shows uh, on the top part of that when we filed our initial report, it was based on 2020 data, and the bars that you see, the darkest blue at the top, is Nevada's, was at that time Nevada's per pupil funding compared with the national average, and subject matter uh, expert recommended level of funding. You could see the comparison on the low end, $9,548, which represented uh, in 2020, Nevada's level of funding contrasted with the national average at thir nearly 13,500 per student, and the APA subject matter expert recommended level of funding at $14,337 on the bottom part. Uh, there's an attempt to bring the data up to 2024 levels to offer a more current comparison. Uh, with the filing of the governor's budget, the amount of funding on a per pupil basis has been elevated to 11785 
but there has been a growth in the national average as well, moving up to 15,500. And the subject matter expert recommended level of 16,500. I think we're getting an adjustment in the sizing on the charts here. Hopefully that's a, that's a bit better. That is better. Thank and you. This is, better. Thank you. I, have to, I have to thank the technical resources here at LCB for that assistance. Um, and this was the slide we were just looking at again, comparing funding levels. And so that difference between the Nevada per pupil spending and the national average and the subject matter um, uh, expert recommended level of funding, that forms up the basis of the identified need to additionally fund education in the state over the next 10 years. So th this is an important uh, baseline slide. Uh, this one shows a comparison of where uh, in the darker blue lines, uh, we thought we might be um, just projecting forward from 2020. The lighter blue lines incorporate the, the governor's uh, recommended budget and the increase in per pupil funding. I'm gonna skip ahead a couple of slides. And from the, from the perspective of trying to quantify uh, the amount of additional funding needed to reach the national average. Uh, that's what this chart attempts to do. On the left side, those bar charts rep represent the aggregate shortfall each year between what is funded today and what would need to be funded in the future just to hit the national average. So you could look at each year and that amount that's showing at the top of each bar represents the difference between where funding would be uh, without any additional actions taken and where it would need to be uh, to achieve the national average. But more importantly, on the right side, we've been able to modify that because of the increase in per pupil funding provided by the executive budget, where you see now in 24-25, it meets the initial two-year target that was set forth in the, the commission's report. And each of the bars on, uh, as you move from left to right, become smaller than um, they were on the left side. Um, but it still shows that to achieve the national average by 2023, Nevada will need to be dedicating an additional $2.1 billion to education. And I suppose this speaks in, um, um, in a positive way about the legislature's wisdom when they put together SB 543 and identified a 10-year period over which to fund this. Because as you might imagine, if 2033 were brought forward to today, that would represent uh, a, a rather uh, difficult challenge in a very short period of time where uh, spreading that out over a 10-year period would certainly be uh, more feasible for you all to consider. Now we've done the, the same thing with the APA recommended levels of funding. And as you might imagine, since those bars were a bit uh, longer as you moved left to right, uh, the ones that we looked at earlier, um, meaning that APA's recommended funding level was higher than uh, the national average, you would expect to see these numbers be a bit larger too. And again, focusing on the right side, um, an additional $2.6 billion per year would be required by 2033 uh, to achieve the uh, subject matter experts recommended level of funding as opposed to 2.1 billion to reach national average. And, and the reason that we looked at both the national average and uh, the subject matter experts numbers, and by the way, we looked at a, another set of numbers as well that weren't included in the slides, and those came from the, the 17 superintendents of, of schools throughout the, the state. Their numbers were a bit higher than APA's, but we wanted to give you a, a bit of flavor relative to the national average. 
a lot of people can look at averages and, and where we might deviate either high or low. Uh, and, you know, I suppose, uh, you know, one state could be spending money more effective than another state, that sort of thing. And you can wonder whether the average is something that's higher or lower than, than where the target should be. But given the fact that the subject matter experts, as well as the school superintendents, both uh, developed numbers that were higher than the national average, uh, that spoke pretty loudly to the commission that the national average really represents the lower bar uh, and that the subject matter, it, the number probably lies somewhere in between the national average and the subject matter experts numbers. And before we move on and begin to talk about how do you deal with, with numbers like this, um, it's probably worth noting that these numbers need to be reevaluated and rebased each year. They're not static. Uh, that's something we know. Uh, the amount of spending in Nevada changes from biennium to biennium, as you all know better than anyone else. Uh, the amount of the national average changes as the, the different states throughout the country change their level of spending. So that's a number that's constantly moving. Uh, the one that is probably the, the most static and is probably uh, solely subject to inflation each year is the subject matter experts number. But as a part of the ongoing commitment on the part of the Commission on School Funding, uh, we would uh, recommend that we continue to update these numbers and submit them to you at least on an annual basis for your review and hopefully it provides you with uh, a measure of tracking progress over time relative to where we are uh, and how we compare to the national average and the subjects, subject matter uh, experts recommendation. So we, we transcend here to how do you go about addressing numbers like this? And, and I think one of the things that the commission talked about that is extraordinarily important before you get into the you know, comparatively unpleasant uh, categories of funding discussions and taxation and those sorts of things is that there needs to be uh, an ongoing system of measuring the effectiveness of the investments that are being made in education. Uh, obviously, you don't want to uh, continue to invest unless there is some indication to all of you that there is a return on investment and the performance improvements that you're seeking are actually being met over time. Uh, the development of these funding performance metrics should be a top priority uh, for the next interim. And, you know, the commission recognizes this and is ext extremely willing to help develop those metrics that would provide you all with the type of information you need to make some determination about the investments that are being made and the return that Nevada is getting on those investments from year to year. So I didn't want to charge right into talking about funding without providing a recognition that uh, ongoing measurement uh, is an equally important part of this entire process. So to talk about funding options, and we looked at a, a variety of things. One of the things that became very clear early on is that Nevada has historically and traditionally funded a majority of education over its history through the application of property and sales tax. Uh, as you look around the, the country, uh, those are methods that are quite common. Now, obviously, other states will incorporate other revenues, some of which we do not have here in the state. And in more recent years, you know, perhaps the past couple of decades, we've incorporated a number of what, what I would refer to as industry-specific taxes into the funding mix. Uh, and all of you, I know, are aware of some of those. Those include things like the mining tax. That was more recently uh, done to supplement education funding, room tax, cannabis tax. There have been others. Uh, in the past, those would go into the state's general fund. The state's general fund would then in turn appropriate those back to education under the pupil-centered funding plan. Those go directly into 
the state education fund uh, directly to education. One of the other discussions that we had was, well, we spent a considerable amount of time on the attributes or criteria associated with different revenue sources. One of the, uh, one of the uh, key elements of a, of, of a funding system that jumped out that makes sense is to have it be broader based. Uh, Industry-specific taxes are helpful from time to time as long as they're balanced among industries. But every time an industry-specific tax is put into place, one of the things that results is that we tend to ride the, the roller coaster, the economic roller coaster that's associated with that specific industry. Uh, mining certainly has uh, the tendency to go up and down over, over time, uh, long periods of time. Uh, we learn during certain periods of time, whether it's during the Great Recession or during the pandemic, uh, that some of our other tax sources, particularly things like room tax and gaming tax, can be susceptible to uh, economic fluctuation or outside um, uh, influences. And consequently, looking at broader base taxes is something that the Commission felt was a, a more sensible course to take. Um, property tax and sales tax uh, happen, you know, those traditional funding sources for education also happen to be more broadly based than, than industry specific taxes. One of the other things that uh, we recognized, and, and I suppose, you know, me maybe more so than many other members of the Commission because my of my involvement over the past four decades with topics very close to this is looking at uh, traditional funding sources like property tax and sales tax also gives us an opportunity to look at long-standing issues within both of those taxing systems that need to be addressed. I mean, even if it weren't for the additional funding needed for education, uh, looking at your fiscal system from time to time and running some diagnostics on how well it's performing and whether or not it's moving in the right direction, uh, given changes in technology and society and other such things is something that's uh, highly advisable to do. So, you know, the melding of uh, looking for uh, education-related funding and uh, dealing with perhaps some long-standing issues relative to sales and property tax certainly made some sense to us. As we all know, for example, with sales tax, the tendency over the past several uh, sessions of the legislature and probably past couple of decades is to look at sales tax in the form of tax rate uh, increases to generate revenue. You know, uh, examples would have been things like transportation, public safety, water uh, and sanitation and others where uh, pieces of the sales tax have been identified and carved out to help fund each one of those areas and they're all very important areas. However, the, the real future potential within the, the sales and excise tax realm probably lies within the base that's used for uh, taxable types of sales. Uh, again, that base has, uh, has been affected dramatically over the last uh, 30 or 40 years with changes in technology alone um, and the movement toward more services and away from, from goods. Uh, this particular chart demonstrates that, you know, since the mid-1960s when goods were a larger part of the economy than, than services, uh, you could see the disparity that's uh, that's occurred over the years between the two. Uh, services now form two thirds of our overall economy, and and uh, actually tangible goods only form one third of that. And it's important to bear in mind that when we think about something like sales tax, the way that that is written into, I believe, the constitution of the state is that it applies only to the retail purchase of tangible goods. And certainly services are not tangible goods. So you could see that change in the economy has caused a falling away of a lot of the base uh, in favor of some of those things that are considered intangible at this point. And this is one of the reasons I mentioned that this is something that we need to probably reevaluate every few years to ensure that 
um, items that uh, were previously taxable and the examples that you know we oftentimes use are things like books that you purchased at a bookstore many years ago you now download books uh, it was taxable when you purchased it at a, at a bookstore but it's not taxable if you download it the same thing with music with movies there's a number of other examples that are uh, easy to use but the point is uh, we've had an economy that's been shifting away from the base uh, at the time that sales tax was originally uh, put into place. The next chart is just essentially to show that um, sales tax also has some volatility about it. Um, you could see on the left hand side of that chart, uh, referring to the dotted line in the middle, which is the long run average, there were some very, very good years up through about 2008. And that was the time of the Great Recession. It fell off. You could see the recovery time it took to basically get back to where things were in 2006. And we're not quite back to that point. Sales tax is performing very well today, but mostly in comparison to the, the last two or three years. But there is some volatility about it. And I point this out because as the base is narrow to begin with because it doesn't include a lot of things that are discretionary that people purchase uh, the narrower the base is the more reliant you are on the areas of trade that are part of the sales tax base to continue performing well year in and year out uh, it's interesting when you think about it uh, in clark county the number number one producer of sales tax uh, just under 20 percent are eating and drinking establishments uh, certainly during the pandemic, we couldn't rely on that, our largest producer, to produce much revenue. Uh, by contrast, in Washoe County, the largest producer of taxable sales is the sale of motor vehicles. Um, quite a different e economy up there, and motor vehicles were actually performing certainly better during the pandemic than were eating and drinking establishments. But the point of all of that is, the broader the base that we have uh, as a sales and excise, excise tax base, the less we're relying on certain areas of trade to perform well year in and year out, and the more diversified the excise tax portfolio becomes. So in thinking and talking about this, one of the things that we asked uh, our, our support staff to do is give us an indication of some things that are taxable in other states that aren't taxable in Nevada. And you see some of those examples before you there. Now, some of these arguably may be uh, taxed under different categories of taxes in Nevada. Um, and it doesn't mean that they aren't taxed, but as you look up and down this, well, in the middle of the list, for example, are those downloads uh, that we talked about. Uh, that are taxable in other states and aren't taxable in Nevada. Uh, higher on the list, you would see software, you see digital, you see mu music, you see books. Um, so are there some things here that we could look at? Yes. Are there some things on this list that you probably would never want to look at? Probably. Uh, the, the issue of regressivity always comes up when we talk about sales tax, and to that point, uh, the, to the extent that we're applying an excise tax to things that are necessities of life, the regressivity argument is certainly a very strong argument. To the extent that they're being applied to more discretionary things and non-necessities for life, it's less regressive. So it's not a question of all things being regressive. It's a question of degrees of regressivity depending upon the types of things you apply it to. So I wanted to take a look uh, just to give ourselves an indication of you know, what the level of activity might be in certain categories of our economy. Uh, and you can see some of them before you, and they're fairly large amounts. Uh, a couple that I would like to focus on in the interest of time, uh, because I know we do have limited time today, but let's look at, uh, as an example, uh, recreation. Uh, at $4.2 billion a year estimated economic activity in Nevada, and let's look at personal care, $5.8 billion, as two examples. Those would appear, at least by title, to be a bit more discretionary than perhaps some of the others, and for convenience, they happen to add up to $10 billion of economic activity. 
This chart, uh, I don't know if this is readable, uh, particularly on the screens. Hopefully you have a copy in front of you and it may be helpful to you. But let's take that $10 billion for a moment and across the, the horizontal axis find that on this chart. And you find it about midway through. And on the, um, uh, the vertical axis of the matrix, you see different rates of potential taxation. Uh, and let's just use a 5% rate as a, for instance, to get oriented with this particular chart. So if you find the meeting point between $10 billion of additional economic activity at a 5% rate, you get a number, uh, the math is pretty simple on that one, $500 million per year. And if you relate that back to uh, the charts that we were looking at earlier, the amount of challenge that we have ahead of us to meet the national average and to meet the APA uh, recommended levels could something like this, uh, an expansion of the base over time, uh, be a material contributor to that? I, I believe this chart would indicate that the answer to that would be certainly yes. And turning to property tax for a moment, and I probably should have said this earlier in my discussion with you, but none of us on the commission look at discussion of things like sales tax and property tax or any other form of taxation lightly. Uh, we realize uh, that these are very difficult topics to deal with. Um, and uh, again, our observations are, are not made lightly to you all in that regard. But turning to property tax, uh, this is another system that has evolved dramatically over the last uh, 20, 30, or 40 years. Uh, I remember uh, the first session that I ever participated in this legislative process was 1981, the year of the, uh, the tax shift. Um, when I think about how long ago that was, it's a little, little depressing, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> That was my first experience with this. And since that time, well, during that session when there was a shift away from uh, property tax to sales tax, that was a monumental change in the way that property tax is approached in this state. And since that time, there have been another, a, a number of additional material changes to the way that property tax is managed. Uh, one of the items that becomes a, a, a clear impediment to generation of additional revenue through the property tax system is the system of abatements that was put into place. I can't remember which session, but it seems to me it was 10 or 15 years ago, something like that, uh, which limits the amount of uh, property tax revenue that can be uh, grown each year. Uh, and consequently, it limits the, since property tax is a material source of funding for education, limits the ability of property tax to be a part of that solution. So the abatements are something that require uh, additional review and attention to see if they're still serving the purpose that they were uh, initially intended to serve. Uh, in the state of Nevada as well, uh, we use a system that looks at the, the full cash value of land, which is uh, seemingly reasonable, and the replacement cost of improvements, not the market value of improvements, but the replacement cost of improvements depreciated by 1.5% per year for up to 50 years. So a 50-year-old property uh, with improvements, the improvements are are assessed for taxation at a level of 25% of their replacement value, notwithstanding what that market value may be. And Nevada is the only state in the United States that uses depreciation in this manner uh, to, to, to determine valuation. And I know that there have been uh, prior attempts to have discussions around uh, the notion of depreciation, but I would point out that without also having discussions regarding abatements, uh, the discussion regarding appreciate, uh, depreciation uh, may be somewhat moot with respect to its ability to generate additional revenue. And then, of course, there are things like the assessment ratio that you know, we're using 35% of the of the um, taxable value to determine the assessed value, the 
percent. I remember how and when that was derived, and that was a number less of science and perhaps more of convenience to arrive at a, a desired outcome at that point in time. And then, of course, you have caps on uh, combined tax rates throughout the state at $3.66 uh, for state, local, school, special district, and so forth, and a number of your counties throughout the state are at that cap and without some relief could not rise above that cap and consequently couldn't participate if there were additional property tax made available. Now, property tax should be one of the most stable and predictable revenue sources that we have. Uh, with the abatements, it's, it's become a little bit more um, of a mathematical exercise to determine what the worth of property tax um, increments may be. And I think it's important to point out that the current level of abatements that have accrued since the abatements were put into place, and again, this is something that's ebbed and flowed a bit over the years, you know, particularly following the Great Recession, but the current level of abatements exceed a billion dollars in the state. It's one of the other reasons that we wanted to bring this to everyone's attention. And I know I've thrown a lot at you very, very quickly, and uh, I know that uh, well, there was a limitation on the time I had, but I at least wanted to get uh, these thoughts and observations in front of you, Madam Chair, for, uh, for your consideration. Thank you. And so, um, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, there's a lot there and a lot to digest, but I think we probably have a few questions. And if I could start with one. Um, so on the per people funding comparison, um, the difference between um, Nevada and the subject uh, matter expert in 2020 is about give or take $5,000. In 2024, even though we've added more money, the proposal is to add more money, we're still about $5,000 apart. So it doesn't appear to me that we've made any progress by allocating more money in the, if we were to stick to the governor's budget. So I'm just wondering um, how you might respond to that. Madam Chair, <clears throat> once again, Guy Hobbs. I think there are maybe a couple of responses to that. I, I, I think in part it indicates uh, how low the funding was even before the additional funding was added uh, and that adding the additional funding, um, you know, it looks like it helped keep pace but without the additional funding, we would certainly be that much further behind and there would be that much more of a, of a delta. So I think those of us that were particularly looking at this uh, as, a, as a 10 year phase in to achieve the national average and the subject matter experts level of recommended funding took the additional funding as uh, very, very good news. I mean, it did reduce the overall delta uh, as you saw in those side by side bar charts. Thank you. And, and the other part of oh. it is, uh, I'm sorry, I'm no, sorry, go Madam ahead. Chair. You know, no, we, go ahead. we do expect that we'll get new numbers in May uh, from NCES, uh, National Center for Education Statistics. And we do expect to see, you know, for example, the national average numbers change again. And, you know, whether or not Nevada's change was, was greater than the national average is something we have yet to see, but that's one of the reasons I was recommending to you that we con we continue to uh, use this as an indicator of our progress in closing those gaps. Thank you. And, and then uh, if I could move on to the taxes part, which is always a difficult dis uh, discussion for everyone. But um, I think that in looking at what you presented, we can pick and choose sales tax till the day is done and they're just band-aids and I think what what I hear you saying and please correct me if I'm wrong but what I hear you saying is we need to look at the big picture and we need to come up with sustainable funding that's going to fund education for years to come and so I'm just 
Is is that am I correct in that assumption? Madam Chair, again, Guy Hobbs, yes. I, I think it's true on two fronts. One, uh, in terms of finding additional resources for education, and number two, uh, even if we weren't facing this, I would be the first one to tell you, having worked in and around uh, public finance and taxation in this state for the past 40 years, that the sales tax base has been eroding and the sales tax base will continue to erode over time and that is probably a not not a desirable place to be uh, it then can play less and less of a role that it was originally intended to play in the funding of things like education but also local government and and various programs throughout the state and on the property tax side the same thing the more um, I don't know um, I, I was thinking of the words bells and whistles and I don't like that term but that we add to the property tax system, the more complicated it becomes when it was one of the simplest and most reliable forms of funding governmental services we ever had in this state. Thank you. I, I guess, and, and in summary, I, I, I this is just going to be a statement, but it appears to me that our state needs to decide where our commitment's going to lie. And if we're going to um, fund education at a level that's going to meet the needs of our children and our state, or if we're just going to pick and choose and create Band-Aids and keep creating Band-Aids. And with that, I'll move to Senator Titus. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for the uh, questions. And thank you for um, the presentation, but I find it incredibly underwhelming. Um, you, you gave us some data points with just literally not any points, just numbers without any true, I think, basis behind them, just using numbers of what we spend as a state. And then you compare it to the average of other states without adding all the other funds that we put into education. And what I mean by that is what I would like to see, and perhaps you could get that to us, because I think it would be helpful. State, we, there's never any one source of funding for education by just the states. As we all know, we get federal funds, and each state gets federal funds. And what I'd really like to see, if you could get that to us, is that, yes, our state puts X dollars into education versus another state, but how much are other states offset by the federal government? And are we also at the bottom of what other states get from the federal government? Because that would make a little bit sense to me versus are we, maybe we get more money compared to other states. So the overall funding for education in our state isn't as uh, dramatic as it would look here. So that would be one thing I'd love to get from you and you can, and I have a couple other, I uh, have a couple other questions by my manager. So do you want to take sure. that one now or do you want to get that information to us? Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Titus, uh, Madam Chair, to respond. Uh, again, Guy Hobbs. This, uh, this comparison of Nevada's level of funding to the national average and to uh, a benchmark established by the subject matter expert, I think is one of the most important points of this entire discussion because if, if we can't get to a point where we at least agree uh, with the level of challenge that we have, getting to a solution is almost next to impossible and I believe the members of the commission uh, uh, clearly recognize that. Uh, one of the things about the comparisons, and I'm sorry I haven't brought the uh, slides back to th those particular comparisons, but uh, we took great caution in using data that uh, included and excluded the same values. In other words, comparing Nevada spending does not include federal funds and does not include capital dollars. Neither does the national average include federal funds or capital dollars, and neither does the APA number include federal funds or capital dollars. I think one of the things that has created problems in this discussion in the past is that you have been given so many different numbers about what Nevada's level of spending is um, with and without capital, with and without federal funds, with and without this or that, that it becomes uh, almost mind-boggling 
uh, in terms of quantifying the problem. What we intended to do here was give you apples to apples comparisons and that's what we've provided you. They are directly comparable to one another. Uh, thank you for that, and if I might, some other questions. So just on the apples to apples analogy, I would tell you that it's there's uh, Red Delicious apples and there's Granny Smith apples, so when you use that analogy, it's not the same. So moving on, I, I'm a healthcare provider, as I, every, most people know, um, and, and what we spend on healthcare is the highest of any developed nation, but yet we have the poorest outcome. So I would say that what we spend doesn't necessarily equate with quality. So that's just an opinion. Um, the next question I have is we know that in other states, so outcomes is important, outcome data regarding how our children are doing, are all our kids reaching their best potential? And we know that there are many other states that spend less money than we do but have better ed educational outcomes. So that kind of information, I think, is relevant. So you know, where, where does an other states, um, you showed us an apple average, but where, there are states that Utah, I would use an example, um, have better outcomes, but they spend a lot less. So where is that information? Uh, Senator Titus, and again, Madam Chair, Guy Hobbs, to address that question. Uh, you raise a very, very good point, and I think it's an incredibly important one, that when you're talking about the investment of money, it has to be done hand-in-hand -hand with expectations when you're making the investment, and measurements after the investment has been made to, to ensure that you're actually achieving the desired outcomes. Um, as an earlier part of my comments to you, I think it is incredibly important for the commission and then you all to agree to what those performance measures are going to be. Um, I don't think I could sit here and, and ask any of you uh, to make a continuing investment uh, over the next five legislative sessions in education without the confidence that you're doing it in such a way that it's going to move the needle on performance and in fact through measurements has moved that needle. So again, the commission offers to be a party to helping to develop those metrics to bring back to you so you can ensure yourselves when you're being asked to increase those investments that that's being done wisely. Uh, thank you, sir, and I, I appreciate that, and I appreciate all that you do bring to the table, but it just, to me, we need so much more, especially more data about ROI. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the questions. You're welcome. Senator Neal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr. Hobbs, for your presentation. Um, I took a lot from it. I've been, this is, I think, my third or fourth presentation on this. As you know, I've carried digital goods forever at this point. I think I'm in session three. Um, there isn't a lot of appetite in order to um, close, I guess, what I consider leakage within the sales tax base. Um, but I'm going to try it again and keep putting it on the record. But I had a question on the property tax um, information and the and the um, abatements because I really wanted to get your opinion. So I, I've looked at property tax abatements, the application of depreciation, and the caps on the combined property tax rates. And what I found is that we we did such a good job, right, of creating the um, abatements in 2005 that basically the whole purpose of abatements was to protect property from property tax rates from growing and it does exactly that and so when I looked at you know capping the property tax rates and just doing a freeze saying okay we've got 1.5 billion in property tax abated let's freeze it well that then raises property tax. So what came back was a 30 to 40% increase. And so I didn't go forward with that piece of legislation because I didn't want to be harpooned, right? Pitchforks coming out, how dare you raise our property? But, but I wanted to, um, you know, trying to figure out how to fix this because I also looked at the depreciation. So I actually have that in a bill where I'm reducing it to slow it down so that the new 
properties can come into the base and stay there longer. However, the abatement is a trigger on the other side, right? So the abatement will still keep growing, although the property will stay in there longer. So there's, so there's a balancing act. So if you had an, an, an advice that is not pitchfork worthy, um, <laughs> what would you say would be the combination, right? Because if you don't do anything about the abatement, then the depreciation is like a, it's a slow pool that you're doing that won't gain a release um, in the property tax coming back into the base to fund. Uh, Senator Neal, uh, Madam Chair, Guy Hobbs once again. <clears throat> you raise a, a lot of very interesting points that were very much on our minds and is if you were to have the opportunity to go through the report we filed uh, this past, I believe, October. October or November, um, and I, I think the fact that it was 400 pages caused a lot of people to perhaps not uh, pour through it, but uh, uh, you'll see that we evaluated a number of different things. One of them would have been freezing the abatements at their current level. One of them would have been phasing abatements out over time. Uh, obviously, the the sudden shock to the system of just eliminating abatements is something that I think all of you would find untenable, um, perhaps more untenable than some of the other things that we're talking about. Um, but certainly uh, freezing the abatements is a good way to, uh, you know, perhaps begin that analysis. Uh, the same with depreciation. I took from what you said that uh, freezing depreciation at its current level uh, because there is a certain amount of accumulated depreciation on all property would be uh, something that could be evaluated. Reducing the rates of growth and depreciation or additive depreciation over time would certainly be another way. Reducing the depreciation factors themselves, eliminating depreciation eventually, all of those things I think would be on the list. And as you correctly point out, all of them have to be done hand in hand with a discussion on abatements. Because otherwise, uh, you don't necessarily accomplish the revenue objectives that you might have for education, but you resolve the, I don't know, the intellectual complexities of depreciation uh, without the benefit of the revenue. Uh, and this is not a trivial task. And, you know, certainly I'm not presenting it to you as though there is a simple solution to this. But I do believe that perhaps over the, the next interim, direction can be given to our commission. We'd be very happy to undertake this or to some other, uh, I don't know, group or, or device that, that might you know, provide some of the answers that you're seeking. Um, none of them come uh, without the, I suppose, the price of either sales tax going up because you're adding something to the base or property taxes going up because you're removing depreciation or freezing depreciation. That's a consequence of all of them. Um, and consequently, as has been noted, it's not a simple discussion and it's not one that anyone, uh, including this commission, takes very lightly. And certainly those of you that have to ultimately make that decision are in perhaps the, the more challenging position of having to weigh uh, the needs of education against the, the price of additional revenue. Uh, again, not an enviable position to be in, but I think that you know, ultimately it comes down to that. Madam Chair, follow up. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So, I, and listen, I get it, um, you know, we're, we're we're, we, every session we weigh revenue against the political cost to the membership in the building, right? And clearly the political membership in the building would like to stay in the building. So <laughs> revenue seems to, it, it's always a challenge. But I, I did want to ask you another question because on Saturday, um, the Finance Committee, Senate uh, and Assembly stayed here for several hours, and we learned a lot about education in the state or entities within the state. And what really came up to me, and it's, I don't know if this was examined in the 400 pages, um, 
how we perform economic development in some of our um, smaller counties without in without the tax abatements that we are pulling off, you know, in in Washoe and and in Clark. And the reason why I say that is because when I when I started to think about what they were saying in terms of like their challenges within the smaller counties that haven't had the benefit of economic development overflow from trick. Um, there are counties that literally don't have any jobs, right? So you can't, so the imbalance in the state between like the centers, so like Lyon, it's okay. Elko's probably in a br pretty good place. Washoe and then Clark, and then we have these outliers. And ultimately, I want to know if there's at least a conversation on how we advance economic development through those counties so that all sales can be lifted, right, in terms of jobs, in terms of movement, so that when the tax policy comes through, it's not so hard, right? And that's the thing that I realize. We come from Clark with the majority of the population, and, and we're thinking about Clark because of what they raise. However, um, the other counties, they can't sustain certain, certain policy, right, because their people literally don't make any money. The, where they go to work is a government job or it's no job, right? And so that just made me think, like, we need to have a conversation broadly about the economic development strategy beyond the centers that we've been discussing and how we lift all sales without abating their sales tax or whatever little sales tax and property tax revenue that they have because they can't give it up because it's almost the bread and butter to how they run their county in general. Senator Daniel, Madam Chair, um, just a simple uh, comment back. Although we didn't focus on economic development in uh, some of the rural counties, uh, the point that has been raised is a very good one, and the commission would be very pleased to undertake that. I will tell you that as a part of the review, and we recognize that all 17 of the school districts throughout the state are, are equally important, notwithstanding the fact that they have different levels of enrollment from uh, under 100 in one of the counties to well over 400,000 in another county. We have every variety you could possibly imagine in this state, and some of them, um, White Pine County as an example, has had a need to replace a, a school. Now, funding of capital was not part of our charge, but we obviously uh, couldn't uh, neglect thinking about uh, the impacts that badly or poorly maintained or, or obsolete capital or, you know, the buildings way past their useful life can have on the educational process. Uh, we recognize they have a school that's over 100 years old and needs replacing, but they're at their $3.66 cap on the property tax side. And do they have the type of economy, even if we provided a very favorable loan, to repay that loan? Probably not simply, no. Um, and those are problems that need to be addressed as well. So we did include a recommendation that consideration be given to using the state infrastructure bank as a way of at least making some funds available with terms that even those more economically challenged counties might be able to cobble together to deal with some of their needs. Uh, but you raise a very, very good point, and certainly uh, if and as the commission continues its work, I'll make sure that that's a point that we undertake. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any further questions from the committee? Senator Buck. Thank you, Chair Lang, and thank you, um, Mr. Hobbs, for your presentation. It's always informative. <laughs> um, I was wondering about the SPED discretionary units. Is that included in this? Because according to um, my records, like Clark gets 1,100 extra per student, uh, Washoe 1,500 state public charter school students 800. 
is this extra dollars or is this included in, in your presentation in the overall funding? Uh, Senator, um, Madam Chair, I probably am going to need to talk to uh, Nevada Department of Education. I don't want to give you uh, an off-the-cuff answer, but my belief, my belief is that all funding is included other than that which is federal and designated for capital outlay. Uh, so I believe that's the case, but I'll, I'll confirm that back to you. Thank you. Thank you, and if you get that to us, we'll get it out to the members of the committee. Any further questions? Seeing none, we want to thank you so much for coming back today and spending a little bit more time with us. Uh, this is important information and gives us a lot of uh, room for thought, and uh, hopefully we can move forward and we'll have continued conversations. Thanks so much. Thank you all very much. Okay, with that, we're going to move into the bill hearing for Senate Bill 47. And when you're ready, please go ahead. All right, good afternoon, Chair Lang, members of the committee. My name is Patricia Haddad, and I am the Director of Government Relations for the Clark County School District. Um, it is an honor to be before you all today um, to discuss the components of Senate Bill 47. Um, I will be presenting this bill with a conceptual amendment based on feedback that we've received from members of this committee, uh, stakeholders in the community, um, and, and actually other legislators as well. And uh, I think specifically, uh, uh, one thing I'd like to highlight is, is from this amendment is, is removing the task force component. Um, so I'll be discussing the, the other portions from there. Um, and the task force component is, you know, I, I, there are multiple task forces that have come before this committee this session. And so we feel confident that um, the details that we had included in ours will um, be covered by those. So. Um, so CCSD has over 40,000 employees responsible for ensuring that the 304,000 plus students who attend CCSD schools have access to high quality environments that support their academic and social behavioral needs so that they can graduate with the skills they need in order to thrive in the next phase of their life, whatever that may be. And I think what we are all um, abundantly clear on is that in order for students to be successful, the adults, the professionals uh, who serve the children of our communities must have exceptional working conditions that honor their commitment, professionalism, and humanity. And this is both in order to ensure there's a pipeline of individuals who are interested in entering the education profession, and also that the folks that do enter uh, the, ed the public education system um, for their profession are retained. And so to that end, I'm gonna talk through the two major components of SB 47. So uh, one component is looking at uh, the fees for educator licensure. Um, specifically, we're looking to cap the fees for educator, educator licenses at $50 for both initial licenses and renewals. Um, so the Commission on Professional Standards, based on NRS, may set a fee of no less than $100 for educator licenses. Currently, those fees are set at $180 for new licenses and $150 for renewals, plus $50 for each additional endorsement. And now at a time when we're experiencing critical lab labor shortages of licensed educators, teachers, school social workers, et cetera, and on from there, charging folks hundreds of dollars to do a job we desperately need, I think is counterintuitive to say the least. Um, this is really about removing barriers to becoming and staying a licensed educator in Nevada. 
I think if we're serious about disrupting cycles of poverty, fostering a diverse educator workforce that reflects the social and cultural experiences of the students that we seek to serve, we must be mindful of the financial barriers that exist for folks to even get started. Um, and, and just a note on the $50, so uh, the uh, initial um, draft of the bill uh, took away the, the fees completely, um, but we wanted to ensure that the cost of fingerprinting um, was still covered, um, and then based on feedback by some committee members and, and others in the community, we wanted to ensure that there was some applicant accountability that existed, existed there well, uh, as well. And um, I also wanted to note that in conversations with the Department of Education, they were looking at other states who removed their licensure fees completely um, and, and afterwards saw a significant increase in the number of applications that were being received. So that's, that is the licensure fees. Um, the second part of SB 47 is clarifying the antiquated term teacherage that currently exists in NRS in relation to the types of buildings that uh, uh, boards of trustees, school districts may build, purchase, or rent. Um, and, and we'd like to uh, uh, clarify that language to include uh, teacherages and other residential dwellings for employees of the school district and that they might be directly owned or rented by the district or operated through a partnership with another person or entity. Um, we wanted to ensure that uh, uh, we were having a conversation about what this looks like to, to expand beyond just teachers and ensure that our critical support staff and, and others um, might be included in, in, in what that definition might look like. But um, essentially, CCSD owns parcels of land that are not suitable for building a school, either based on the size of the land or how the development has occurred in the area around it. Um, so as we were exploring various options for the use of this land, um, we noted, like I said, the, this, this antiquated term teacherage um, in the NRS. And while we can, of course, make assumptions that this means housing for teachers, um, in preparing to research what other jurisdictions across the country do in relation to educator workforce housing, um, our general counsel flagged that there was a concern that there's no definition for teacherage in NRS. And so we want to ensure that that clarity exists in, in the law. And um, I also want to be sure uh, uh, to make clear that we are not proposing to necessarily add any additional permissions, just clarify, uh, explicitly clarify uh, the right that, that we and, and through conversations with other stakeholders agree that already exists. We just want to make sure we're, we're getting it in there appropriately. Um, and, and just a note on, 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 on educator and, and workforce housing. So, you know, of course, one of the many obstacles educators and support staff face is the high cost of housing in rural and urban communities throughout Nevada. Um, securing affordable, adequate housing is no simple task in Southern or Northern Nevada and oftentimes anywhere in between. Um, we have a shortage of housing units that educators can afford. And you know, over the past few years, we've seen unprecedented spikes in the cost of housing reaching extreme levels truly during the pandemic. Um, if you've ever been housing insecure or know someone who has, you know the debilitating stress that ensues when your housing situation is in question. And this stress compromises a person's ability to be fully present. And for educators in particular, who already deal with immense challenges just by virtue of the job that they're doing, um, it's important that we're creative about how we might continue to make Nevada a competitive draw for educators. Um, so uh, uh, in closing, I just wanna thank you all for your time and thoughtful consideration of this legislation that we're proposing. We're really grateful to each of you that have had discussions with us about this. Um, it's gone through a couple of revisions uh, over the past few weeks. And we're also grateful to the stakeholders um, out in the community that have worked with us to, to identify concerns and, and hopefully remedy those as well. And then of course, for those that, that are uh, joining us today in support. So, Thank you so much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, and thank you for the presentation. Let me go to Senator Neal. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I have a couple of questions. So in section one, and I believe it, it would apply in section two as well, where you then add the residential dwellings. Um, 
understand the idea, understand the concept, but it looks like this is going in under the capital improvement. Is it? So my understanding is that anywhere there was reference to teacherage, um, which included uh, uh, these particular sections, that that's where that clarifying language was inserted. I'm sorry, Patricia had it for the record. I apologize. So clarifying language meaning that it won't apply to the CIP, the capital money? Um, clarifying language around uh, any time the term Please say your name. Sorry, I apologize. Patricia had it for the record. My apologies. Um, so anywhere that teacherage is referenced, including in these particular sections, so we're, we're not uh, adding uh, uh, any types of buildings necessarily that, ha that don't already exist in the NRS. It's just ensuring that teacherages and other residential dwellings for employees, this and other residential dwellings is, is our attempt to clarify uh, uh, the teacherage portion, recognizing that there is some um, educator workforce housing that exists in the state, um, mostly in, in, in uh, some remote rural areas. We didn't want to compromise the teacherage language um, and therefore added uh, uh, this additional component there. Okay, so, okay, so I understand what you're saying. You're saying that it exists in other places, but it hasn't existed in Clark County. Correct? That's my understanding. Right. Okay. So then this statute, um, 387-205, places it under bonding authority. And so because when I looked at the statute, it's the maintenance of schools, payment of industrial insurance, and then it had other, other things in it. So talk to me about how bonding would work in this scenario. That's the first part. And then the second part, because the CIP that was done or the bonding authority from 2015, there's still some money left there. And I was looking at the revision. It's the fifth revision, which I believe has $525 million that was decided for flexible use. So can you address how, how that the bonding would work? And then the um, is any of that flexible authority for modernization um, being applied to this. Thank you, Patricia Haddad, for the record. Um, so uh, in reference to the uh, uh, capital improvement plan, that's correct, we are in the fifth revision. Um, based on new buildings that are already uh, uh, scheduled, as well as modernizations, um, we are still short in, in um, what we will need overall through the capital improvement plan. That is my understanding. Um, so there, we have not at this time contemplated um, really how or in what form teacherages or any sort of workforce housing um, might be, uh, 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 funding might be leveraged to support it. Um, what we would like to do is be able, through this explicit uh, uh, clarification, be able to continue to research from there. Um, I, and I'm happy to, I, I, I am, uh, uh, have a surface level understanding of, of bonding uh, in general, and so I would be happy to provide some additional information. Okay, thank you for that. Madam Chair, can I have a follow up? Yes. So let's say this happens in Clark County, um, and, the residential dwellings become a part of, well, technically they would be owned by the district, right? It, there are multiple ways that we could potentially go about it. So the district owns the land. Um, what we could do is enter potentially in, into to various types of partnerships, public or private, um, in order to, to develop the actual uh, uh, buildings and, and, and go on from there. And then it would be based on sort of what the agreement looked like um, between the district and the entity. Okay, and so for the record. I'm sorry. Th thank you for that. And so that's getting to kind of where I'm going. So if you have the public, let's say you have the public-private partnership. Let's say it's just public. The point is, it's the funding that is being, um, because the bonding is something that is could potentially be used or probably will be used. To me, this opens several other doors, right, about maintenance maintenance of the facilities, right, who maintains it, what collective bargaining units then would apply to this, right, because in the statute that you're in, you know, there's transportation, there are schools, there are other things that play into when you start saying that public dollars will then be used for a thing 
under this particular statute, right? And so I want, I mean, it sounds like it's a theory, but in the theory before you brought this bill, you guys must have thought about, all right, who's going to maintain this, right? What would happen if there was liability inside of it? What would happen if there was a construction defect inside of this building? What would happen if there was um, harm that happened inside of this? Who's then responsible? Because it's not going to be the teachers. And then someone's going to say, well, it was public money. It came with bonding. It came with all of these other things. And naturally, um, I would be looking at what authority is derived from NRS 387 and any other statutes that, you know, would bring into play around liability. Uh, Patricia Haddad, thank you for that question. So um, I, I can't. Let me. So uh, I think to your point, right? Uh, uh, I, I think that that's potentially an assumption, right, around sort of what what types of dollars might be leveraged in order to fund something along these lines. I will tell you that um, in the research, you know, we looked at, I want to say, uh, 18 different jurisdictions across the country and how they are leveraging public funds, private funds, some ex some exclusively public, some exclusively pri private, some um, with, with some sort of mix in between. Um, <clears throat> as we started looking into that, though, very early on, um, our general counsel was like, hang on, before we get any further, before we expend any types of resources or really spend any additional time on identifying whether this might be viable, on spending time figuring out what braided funding might look like for these types of projects, that the, this explicit authority needs to exist and this clarification needs to exist. Um, I would, uh, you know, as far as the inclusion on, on these additional, um, you know, on NRS 387.205, uh, uh, you know, when we were discussing with, with LCB, they um, wanted to, or, you know, as it was drafting, um, wanted to ensure that it was included in these different places where teachers are referenced. But again, you know, we're very, very, very early in, in sort of any sort of conceptual um, uh, planning or exploring of what this housing might look like. And so um, I, I, don't, I don't think that we've gotten that far down the road in, in planning to be able to answer some of those questions at this time. Um, ensuring that we have the explicit authority before, again, spending that time and, and resources to get there. Madam Chair, quick follow-up. Yes. So I get it. You're in exploratory phase, but the exploratory phase is giving you power that opens several doors. You need to have those answers about those doors, or you need to put guardrails around those doors that you're going to open while you explore, right? I don't, I don't believe in giving power and then say, oh, but the power then gave me all of these things that you didn't intend or didn't imagine they would give. And so um, I think that does matter, right, in, in the exploratory phase. And then, and I'm thinking about school districts 700,000 and over, right, where then the school board of trustees are deciding what this looks like, and then the unintended consequences fall at the feet of the legislature, number one, because you explored into a realm that then open liability, then open up questions on whether or not bonding was appropriate for that and whether or not because of the source of public funds did it create some other kinds of um, situations. Um, so I, I understand, I, I just think you need to explore with guardrails and I don't see the guardrails in here. Um, you want the power to do what is a good thing but there's so many unanswered questions and that's actually not okay right and I'm huge on you know appropriate power um, and specifically when it comes down to a large school district that happens to be in Clark County I think there should be a little bit more control over what that power looks like because you have schools if you're going to touch on the existing bonding from 2015 there are schools that still need funding I understand the revision but you're going to change that impact and shouldn't there be, I mean, voters approved it, right? 
from nine, they had 98 bonding, then you have the 2015. Well, really, the 2015 was an extension of the 98 bonding. And so um, I think that those are things that come into play, especially when we're talking about all of the potential theories that you're presenting in this committee today. And these, this is just my personal opinion. Um, so thank you, Madam Chair. Sure. Um, I wanted to ask a quick question about the licenses and the caps. It, you um, had stated that other states saw increase in applications when the fees were removed. And I'm just wondering, were they, were those increases when fees were 100% removed or reduced also? And if so, what, what, um, what were those increases? Can you quantify that? Uh, thank you, Patricia Haddad. I, I don't have the specific numbers of sort of what the increase was that they looked like, what that, um, uh, uh proportion looked like. Um, what I do know is we're looking at Hawaii in particular that removed their licensure fees completely and, and did see a significant increase. I think it required them to add um, something in the realm of, of seven to nine additional people that could process the applications based on the, the influx that they saw at that time. Thank you. And, and um, as long as you mentioned Hawaii, were there any other states that have done this or is that just the main state? That was the main one that we were looking at in, in, in relation to uh, uh, conversations with Nevada Department of Education, but I will pull that additional information for you. Today. That would be great. Thank you. Any further, Senator Titus? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for bringing this forward. I know we have chatted, and uh, thank you for at least not bringing forward the commission. Um, you know, that's a, obviously something that I find very frustrating yet to have another commission. So thank you for recognizing there's lots of other commissions out there that may be doing some of this. Uh, having said that, however, I have some specific questions. Um, so when um, a teach for my education, because I'm not a teacher and I don't apply for the different certificates, I apply every two years for my medical license at one set fee. And regardless of whatever I do within that medical license, I have a license to practice medicine for two years at one set fee. Now, mind you, it's pretty high, but nonetheless, I understand what that's going to be. Do, so you're telling me that every time a teacher got a new certificate within that license period, whatever it is, whether they they had to pay additional fees for that? So Patricia had it for the record. That's correct. So there is a, a base fee for licensure, and then for each additional endorsement, um, it's $50. And the reasoning behind that? Did they have to get, I guess, what was the justification that they could charge them again? Did they have to get fingerprinted every time they do that? Was there some additional cost? A background check has to happen? Or what was the additional cost and why was there a fee? Um, Patricia Haddad, uh, I, I'm not sure if someone is here from the Nevada Department of Education that can speak better to the rationale. I would imagine that it has to do with um, uh, uh, the, the manpower that it would take in order to, to process the additional information and validate it from there. Um, of course, you know, we want to ensure that we're supporting folks who have additional uh, uh, skills and education, um, and that's why we're, we're proposing to just keep it at a flat fee across the board. Um, and then each, uh, my understanding is that each time licensure is renewed, that the, that fingerprinting process does. Uh, right, at the time of licensure, but not with each new endorsement. No. With each renewal. Right. Okay, Thank you. very Appreciate good. Thank you. That was uh, mm -hmm. interesting to me that they had to pay you every time they did some extra training and for me uh, as a provider if I took a class and I could offer a new service to a patient I didn't have to pay a fee for that um, so thank you for that thank you madam chair for the question sure and um, we uh, have asked eat legal about um, the liability to the district uh, for these particular residents and I would like to read to you kind of what he said and then get your response. He said the district would be generally responsible for these kinds of buildings, uh, residents for employees in the same manner as they're responsible for all other buildings in the district. So since it would involve more and a different kind of building, it would likely open the door for a new kind of liability for the district. Also, buildings constructed with this bond money would be the property of the school district, just like all other school buildings. If there were the intent the district to use bond money to build these buildings, then gift them to the employees. I don't see the authority of the district to do that in the provision 
of Chapter 387 of NRS as amended by this bill, and such gift over could impair or violate the voter approved terms of the bonds. Do you have a response for that? Thank you, uh, Patricia Haddad, thank you so much. So uh, I think we're, we're making an assumption that bonding dollars would be used for these purposes. Um, and, and, and that's something that I, that I hesitate to, to affirm that we would or, or that we wouldn't, um, to be clear. And then uh, as far as gifting, um, uh, I would want to know more about sort of what in what context they're referring to as far as what a gift what a gift would look like. I think the way that we're conceptually, or, or what we've seen other models look like are, um, you know, really looking at, uh, 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 you know, a percentage uh, uh, below, <clears throat> excuse me, area median income that is being charged. So it's not free necessarily, right? Folks are still paying for, for the housing if, the, if it's a, a sort of rental type situation. Um, and so, uh, I mean, if there's a reduction or, or some sort of, um, uh, I, I don't want to say voucher, um, uh, offset of the cost. Um, I, I'm not sure how, how a gift, though, is uh, uh, defined in this particular um, context. So would the district become the landlord? Patricia Haddad, um, not necessarily. Um, there could be, a, uh, there's a possibility for a joint venture or partnership with a, a, a management company. Um, or some sort of other uh, organization uh, that, that could potentially provide the, that service. And so the district would need to hire in a partnership, I means they have to make some money somehow. So would the district hire a company? So the idea would be to, sorry, Patricia had it, I apologize. The idea would be to partner with, with an entity. Um, we've got the land. Um, they might be able to um, provide some, some capital to, or have some capital to uh, uh, get the initial project. And then through that joint partnership, um, a development of that land, rents could potentially go towards a management fee for the private entity. Um, and then any profits could, you know, therefore be used to uh, subsidize the overall cost. I don't, I don't think anyone's looking at this as a money-making venture by any means. Thank you. Okay, um, before we change subjects, I'm going to let go back to Senator Neal, and then we'll go to Senator Buck. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I think a couple of things, right? So you talk about public-private or venturship or a management company, but when it's saying it be treated like a school building or school property, right, the only thing that came to mind is, you know, in the past we had like Edison schools, right? But they were still responsible for whatever duties legally the district would be responsible for. And so in, in your theoretical conversation, what did you guys enumerate that would be a transference of legal rights, duties, and authority that would then transfer under this property designation? Whether or not it's a house or not, it still would be treated as school district property, therefore public, therefore all of the things that apply statutorily to a public entity such as a large school district or a smaller school district. And so you can run the list, right? Those things then would kick over, right? Just the same way as a, as a student is, is um, harmed, what's the liability? You have a tenant, school-owned building, liability whether or not it's a home or not. But the point is, I need to know what you guys have examined or in your theory, what did you enumerate as the legal duties and liabilities that would transfer to this? And I don't know if you considered the statute in which you were putting it under because that statute comes with a lot of things. And that statute is the bonding statute. I don't know what other money, unless you guys have a magic pot of money that you need to share with us, either the, if it's not capital funds, then it's per pupil expenditure, then it's other, right? And other is a very small and narrow category. So I know you're talking in theory, but you're presenting a bill and you, you have to be able to break out what you guys talked about in the back room, right, around this theory. 
Thank you. Patricia had it, and I do appreciate that. Um, in relation to the transfer of liability, I don't have that specific information in front of me at this time, and, and I can um, provide that um, uh, if any uh, any conversations have um, occurred in, in uh, to that end. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd be happy happy to bring that back to you. And I do appreciate and and uh, hear you, Sandra Buck. Thank you so much, Chair Lang. And thank you for your presentation. Um, I know with uh, endorsements in particular, there's secondary endorsements, Fed endorsement, library, literacy, TESOL. And each time that you get an endorsement, uh, staff has to look at your credits to make sure that you meet those minimum qualifications to have the endorsement. I was wondering, um, because I can only assume that sub-licenses would be included, if a person was applying for a sub-license, would that be also forgiven or, or at a cheaper rate? Thank you, Patricia had it for the record. Um, I don't believe so based on what we have, uh, based on uh, uh, the adjustment, um, because it's looking directly at the authority that the Commission on Professional Standards has for licensed educators. Um, as far as license uh, for, but for, for licensed substitutes, I, I would have to look at the statute to ensure that those are uh, included or whether or not they are. Okay, Senator Flores. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I know we had an opportunity to discuss offline, and I appreciate the tone and sentiment of the bill, which is how do we help folk get into this profession? How do we make it easier? How do we uh, avoid some expenditures? Uh, how do we make things more efficient? I, I appreciate that kind of lane. Because uh, I've had an opportunity to speak with a little bit with the private sector, uh, and obviously the private sector always feels they can do things much more efficient uh, than how we do things, and uh, very often that's true. <laughs> I know that government and uh, any state agency or government entity were not always the most efficient. Uh, one, one of the things that I uh, have engaged deeply into the conversation with them on is, and I know Senator Titus, in her line of questioning was talking a little, little bit about after these endorsements, are we getting an additional, uh, are we doing an additional background check? How do we justify some of these additional expenditures? Why are we charging $50, et cetera? Um, and one of the things that I've engaged with the private sector on is specifically background checks. My understanding is uh, up here in the north, the background check is done by a third party, a private entity. In other words, you can go to uh, Edgar Flores' Fingerprinting Express and get the background checked done almost instantaneously at a cheaper rate. And I know in Clark County we don't allow for that. Um, and because we were talking about you know, kind of engaging in this conversation now, I just wanted to get some perspective if you had any. Do we know why we're not doing it and in Clark County? I understand that there's like over 50 private companies in that industry, in that area. And I'm curious to know... Um, because I've heard that complaint, and not necessarily strictly just from teachers, but in uh, the community in general, when they're trying to get involved, whether it be uh, uh, as in a volunteer basis, or they're waiting in the pipeline and it takes two or three months just for that background check to come back. Uh, and there's often been this question raised of why don't we allow for the private sector to come in and really help clear up some of those backlogs. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to engage in some of these conversations, uh, but I'd love to engage in it now if you do have some feedback. Thank you, Patricia Haddad, for the record. Um, I don't have a great answer to why we don't uh, engage with the private sector on, on providing those uh, uh, fingerprinting or background check um, 
uh, services. I, I think my understanding of the process right through the state is that it is um, sent over to the central repository, which is also a state agency. Um, and uh, uh, there is a delay in the processing on that end um, when they are, are looking in. I, and I know that they also um, um, send off to the FBI, which, which provides the, them with a response. My understanding is that they're updating their um, IT systems to further automate and expedite uh, uh, timeline on that I, I couldn't speak to. A um, couple of years at least I think at this point uh, uh, in order to expedite that process and, and facilitate it um, to where folks are not having to wait five, six weeks um, for those to come through. Um, but I think it's a, it's a, a challenge in, in, in the way that, um, uh, that that paperwork is processed at this point at, at the state level. Um, I think that the other question would be, you know, to uh, the type of um, things that are being checked for, the um, um, access to information as well, um, and, you know, working with the Department of Public Safety um, to get all of that done. So, but I, I couldn't speak to um, I, I, um, uh, uh, why we don't leverage um, for, through the Department of Education um, a uh, private uh, entity uh, to be able to process those. And Madam Chair, if I may do a brief follow-up. Thank you. And I'd be interested in, in engaging in that conversation further. Um, just because we're, we're engaged in this conversation now through this bill, I think there's an opportunity for allowing for the private sector to come in and help expedite some of the inefficiencies that exist Namely, when, when it's something that, uh, like background checks, where a whole host of industries are, are using these third-party private entities for the same reasons that anybody else would, which is to expedite the background check, right? Uh, the, the faster we can get person A to the training, background check, paperwork, the faster we can get them where we need them to fill that void. And so I would be very much interested in, in, in working alongside of you to see if that would be something we can consider a conversation deeper here. Um, if I may just switch gears, uh, going back to the conversation Senator Neal brought up, uh, I, I understand that in looking at the language, you saw some archaic language, and you realize that there's now an opportunity to engage in a conversation that you hadn't done so in the past, but before even investing any meaningful amount of time or resources into that. You want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and the only thing I'm going to put out there in the universe would be maybe pre preemptively to give some confidence to the committee, because I, I would hate for us to not allow you to allow for your creative ingenuity and to look at other states to see how they're doing X, Y, Z when it comes to this particular subject matter to limit that. I don't want to inhibit you all from engaging in that. But I think there's an opportunity for us to maybe balance it by putting some, some safeguards just to ensure that it doesn't go too far off uh, what we're hoping to accomplish. And I think, you know, maybe uh, Senator Neal, Titus, uh, Buck, um, who brought up the issue, that myself would be willing to work alongside of you just to, you know, where, where is it too far? And I, and I think that, that's where the concern is at now. Um, but I think we could do both. I, I don't necessarily think we, we completely dis regarded and, uh, while we also address some of the concerns preemptively because we've been in this scenario many times before, not with particularly the school district, but where we write kind of a blank authority to a creative idea and then we find ourselves multiple sessions having to bring that back in a little bit, corral the issue because we, uh, we, we kind of signed a, a bigger check than we intended to. And so I think we can do both, and, and I'm willing to work uh, with the, the, the whole committee alongside of you to maybe find some parameters. Because I, I really don't want to tie your hands either. I think there is an opportunity for a deeper conversation to be had here. And I want you to engage in that meaningfully, but at the same time maybe just address some of those parameters early on so that we could ensure that the committee is comfortable. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. But may I just briefly respond? Thank you. I, I do appreciate that and, and, and look for, Patricia had it, I apologize, and um, look forward to engaging those discussions. Um, uh, one thing that I do just want to note is that um, I th based on the teacherage language, colloquially speaking, I, we believe in, in, in conversations with others that the authority already exists. 
And um, so this was an effort in, in to sort of clarifying uh, and sort of building out some of those guardrails on the authority so that we didn't get down the road. And then a big disagreement about what is a teacherage and, you know, what does a definition look like? And, and so that's, that's really a, a, a why we wanted to, to bring some of that language forward. So I absolutely appreciate that and, and look forward to, to continuing that conversation, though, to ensure that um, we can put something together that is satisfactory to the committee. Thank you. Great, thank you, and thank you for the presentation. And with that, if you'll step back, and um, I will ask anyone in Carson City, because there's no one in Las Vegas, anyone in Carson City that wants to speak in favor of this motion to please come to the front table. Good afternoon, Alexander Marks with the Nevada State Education Association speaking in support of Senate Bill 47 to reduce the teacher license costs. And uh, we also appreciate the sponsor's focus on the inclusion of our education support professionals. Thank you. Good, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Mary Przinski. I'm here representing uh, Nevada Association of School Superintendents, an organization that's composed of all 17 superintendents. And uh, we are in support of this bill. And as Senator Flores pointed out, the spirit of the bill is to get teachers and educators in Nevada. And yes, there are some things to work out. There's no question about that. But uh, the idea is we have to provide some housing for people and we have to get this licensure issue straightened out so that people can afford to come out of college with a lot of debt on their head and uh, get their licenses so they can teach. So that's what this bill does and we're in support. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, KB Mejia with the Ferrado Company. I'm here on behalf today of the Nevada Association of School Boards. Um, NASB is in support of SB 47, and in the interest of time, um, we're gonna go ahead and ditto the comments from our colleague um, at the Nevada Association of School Superintendents. Um, thank you for your consideration of this bill, and we ask for your support. Thank you. Uh, BPS, is there anyone on the phone wishing to speak in favor of Senate Bill 47? Thank you, Chair. The public line is open and working, but there are no callers willing to testify at this time. Thank you. Is there anyone in Carson City wishing to speak against Senate Bill 47? Somebody in Las Vegas now. Anybody in Las Vegas wishing to speak against Senate Bill 47? And you said there was no one on the line, so I'll go to neutral. Is there anyone in Carson City wishing to speak neutral on Senate Bill 47? Anyone in Las Vegas wishing to speak neutral on Senate Bill 47? With that, I'd invite you back up if you'd like to make some closing comments. Thank you, Patricia Haddad, uh, Director of Government Relations for the Clark County School District. Again, I, I want to emphasize that it, it really is my honor to be before you all today to engage in this discussion. I, I truly mean that from the bottom of my heart. Um, and uh, also, you know, again, the idea here is, is to ensure that we can support educators, support the adults that wrap their arms around our kids each day. Um, for, to have some stability, to, to lessen some burdens, uh, financial burdens that exist in their lives um, so we can continue to, to build a strong foundation um, for our students. Of course, affordable housing is something that continues to come up over decades you know, through, in our state, um, and, and as well as ensuring that we are uh, creating a strong uh, educational system for our kids. And so again, I, I appreciate the time and consideration and, and look forward to follow-up uh, conversations with each of you. Thank you, and with that, we'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 47 and move to public comment. Is there anyone in Carson City that wishes to give public comment today? Please step forward when you're ready. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Ali Caliendo, and I'm the founder and executive director of a statewide support organization called Foster Kinship. And I just wanted to raise some awareness of a vulnerable population that our school district, our teachers see every single day, and that's children who are not able to live with either of their parents. We call these um, children in non-parental care, and the majority of these kids are living with their relatives, like their grandparents or someone else who's stepping them up to care for them. And unfortunately, um, there's not associated levels of support. And so the school district and teachers are often the first to notice that these kids have some additional needs. 
we just wanted to raise some awareness that there's efforts being done to support these families through foster kinship, and we're also um, available to support teachers, schools, um, and we're collecting data as well as what these families may need. So thank you so much. Thank you so much and good to see you. Anyone else in Carson City? Anyone in Las Vegas wishing to give public comment? Anyone on the phone lines, BPS? Sure, there are no callers willing to provide public comment at this time. Great, thank you. And with that, we'll adjourn the Senate uh, Education Meeting for today, and we'll meet again on Wednesday at 1 o'clock. Meeting adjourned. No, thank you. <laughs>